All right. Well, welcome, everyone, to another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. I'm your host, Matt Hines. Excited to have you here uh, for, uh, boy, our first episode of September. Uh, I don't know where the year's gone, Manny. Uh, my daughter, my oldest child, just started high school. I need time to slow down for a variety of reasons, uh, but funny. happy to be here on another Thursday. For those of you who are joining us on Sales Pipeline Radio live from LinkedIn or YouTube, super excited to have you here. Uh, in the middle of your workday and work week. If you want to join the show, you can do so live. Make a comment. Uh, if you can have a question, a comment, a rebuttal. Uh, it's a little bit of a family show, so keep it safe and sane. Um, but uh, we can make you part of the show. We can ask your question live, uh, give you a shout out here on the show. So if you want to participate, please do. Uh, if you're watching and listening on demand, thank you so much for downloading and subscribing every episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. Uh, all the way back, all 360 plus now, all available on demand at salespipelineradio.com. Uh, this is a real treat. Very excited to have with us today the founder uh, and CEO of Outreach, Manny Medina. Manny, how you doing? I'm excellent, man. Happy, happy to be here. Um, we were just we were just joking before we got started here that you know we're, as we record this in you know early September 2023. Um, I was talking to another another uh, CEO that you and I both know, and he asked me how it's going. I'm like, you know, not my fa- not my favorite year of all the years, you know. And I think a lot of people kind of can can resonate with that. But you made a good point about just sort of you know sharpening the steel right now. Right. And knowing that you get through this, are going to be better, but knowing where to focus on things right now. And I'd love to have you share some of that. Yeah, I think that this is a year in which, uh, you know, we we come from a world in which we will do everything. We will do one of each. We will mm-hmm. take on as many projects as we could. And our portfolio was very large and very broad, you know, with the hope that many of those things will pay out. And now we're forced to prioritize. You know, if you don't have one or two things that you're working on and you're putting all your resources behind you're, 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 you, you'll be doing it wrong. The, yeah. the, uh, the, the appetite for overinvestment, the appetite for waste, the appetite for, um, you know, for growth at all costs has, has gone out the window. So you, now you have to be very judicious of making sure that every dollar lasts and mm-hmm. that the probability of things paying out is higher than, than average. Yeah. So um, I, I like the discipline. I like the, 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 yeah. the thought that, that, you know, this is a world in which, you know, you have to make uh, your investments turn into cash in a very short period of time. Yeah. And, you know, constraints actually frees you to be more creative. You know, the, the creativity and the constraints is far more exciting than, than the, you know, the, um, you know the, the, the time in which, you know, you don't know what to do with the cash, you did everything. Uh, yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's not sour grapes argument, just to be, just to be clear. It's, it is oh, yeah. more of a, you know, this is a different world, but a world that rewards those who are ready for it. I really appreciate everything you just said. I think, uh, you know, a friend of mine who I worked with at a number of startups who's actually running enterprise sales at Smartsheet now, when we worked together, he would have a saying at the top of his whiteboard. It said, you know, startups typically don't starve, they drown, right? They take on too many things. <laughs> you try right. to do too many things. And a big part of strategy is choosing. Um, right. And just before we get into that, I want, to, I want to talk about sales platforms and AI and the things we tend to talk about. But I love this topic because I think, you know, if you are prioritizing, if you are choosing the things to prioritize, by definition, you are leaving things on the table. And Correct. someone else in your company, in your world, cares about those things you are no longer prioritizing. Correct. And they will remind you of that, right? Correct. And that is an anxiety spiral that helps no one. Do you have any, I mean, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, uh, I've just been so impressed at how you built culture and driven, you know, the team and the growth at Outreach. How do you encourage your team to not only prioritize, but accept you know, accept the, sometimes the ramifications of the things that you're not doing. Yeah, it's a it's a different it's it's, it's a it's a it's a really good question because it's, there's no silver bullet for it, and the and the whole you know disagree and commit only works so many times. The right. disagree and commit is, is sort of like you have a you have a a cookie jar, and you only have so many cookies in the cookie jar when you can have somebody disagree and commit before they're like, all right, you're just telling me what to do without selling me. And and right. I think that one of the things that we did really well. Um, by having four co-founders as opposed to just one, is that I couldn't get my co-founders to do anything. Because see, I am the CEO because the CEO was the only job not taking when we started the company. Everybody else would like pick a lane and mm-hmm. the CEO was a lane that wasn't picked. So the, um, the, the, the job for me to get anything going was to have to, have to sell the idea. So we got very used to selling to each other. So we couldn't just say, we're going to go do X. We're going to have to, you know, I, for me to convince my co-founders to do X or Y, I have to go sell them to the X and the Y. And I have to bring in evidence and I have to deal with the kind of arguments. And yeah. we have to spend time in this rock tumbling 
it, you know, and the tumbling and, and, the, and, the, and the friction of the ideas made the rock shinier over time. So, you know, we got really used to selling arguments as opposed to making arguments, selling ideas and selling propositions as yeah. opposed to forcing a proposition through. And, and it's a, and, and um, so in, in this, in this time in which you have to leave things on the table, mm-hmm. it's actually better than that. You have to leave things on the table that other people are very attached to it and that your competitors are going to pick up and run with it. So not yeah. only you're going to get the noise internal from saying, Hey, I want to do that. It's on the table, but your competitor is going to run and go with it. With it and then, and then, you know, whoever had the idea and was attached to the idea on the table is going to say, look, the competitor is running with it. See, I told you so. Yeah. And yeah. And I mean, you have to be okay with that. You have to be, yes, it is on the table. Yeah, I know you like it. Yeah, I know somebody else wrong with it. Our bet is still this one. And yes. the reason it's still good is because of X, Y, and Z. And it's okay yeah. to resell the idea. It's kind of like yeah. rekindling the love with your partner. You have to do it every once in a while, otherwise it goes stale. So it's okay right. to resell the idea, but we have to be aligned. The one thing that we cannot, um, that, that is not a sacrificable thing is alignment. You have to be aligned. You can't yeah. be like doing this one thing and somebody else doing another. That is the case of death. That is how you die quickly. That's so good. Um, if if anyone has, if you haven't read, and I want to move on to some of these other topics we want to cover, but uh, I'm, I can't remember the exact title of it, but there's an article, go Google like Legos on the table, like basically the, this concept of, you know, as you grow your business, there's a million things you can focus on, prioritize what you want, leave the rest of the Legos on the table. Someone else may pick them up and decide that's a priority. And those things, if you prioritize well as a team, as an individual can move your business forward. But I love the concept of just like yeah. focus be willing to sort of say like, there's only so many times you can disagree and commit. And, and I shout out to Jill Richards, who's, you know, said here in the comments, you know, that, that saying no, you know, more than yes, that, that's what focus is, is, is right. finding the things that, you know, saying no more often saying yes to a small number of things, moving it forward. Um, a little bit to one of our other topics today is this whole idea of AI in the workplace, right? Yeah. And I know I want to talk about sort of what that implies around sort of having sort of a platform mentality in your sales in your sales tech stack as well. Um, I feel like we're in this moment where everywhere you turn, you read about the emergence of AI and the importance of AI and the future of AI. Yet at the same time, like I find so many people that just want to have their head in the sand, right? That are right. like, I don't, I don't know what this is. I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to pretend it's not going to happen. Um, you know, we're still, we're very early days on this, uh, but that juxtaposition is really interesting to me. Now that said, AI has been in a lot of tools we've had well before chat GPT. Um, I know that AI, I'm like, I'm, you know, this is not a sales pitch, but I'm a happy outreach customer. I know, and I'm thankful that there's AI in the platform that I use and our team uses for sales engagement. But how, if, if you're, if you're a sales and marketing leader watching, listening to this, how right now, how should you be thinking about AI in the workplace and why does that matter? So the first, so the first, the first instantiation of AI is to, is to, is to do a survey of your tools of whatever you're using and figuring out, you know, where is AI helping? Like who is actually embracing and how is it showing up in the form of taking a task away or replacing a workflow with something else that was not done before. So for instance, in the, in the course of outreach, if you look at, at a task of building sequences, so our first instantiation of AI is, of course, the generative offering of like writing the emails for you. Like that's, that's, you know, that's part of the course right now. But as you can see, you know, the progression of AI, you will see that outreach will write your own sequences. So you don't have to worry about that. They, it will automatically generate your A-B testing. In the case of Kaya, it will generate new cards. And, you know, one of the things that we're about to release is a scoring. So there is, there is a scoring of the calls. But the scoring of the calls only happens post facto by a manager and it has to be manual when reality doesn't need to be. You know, you, you already know what a great call looks like. So why don't we create, you know, an AI scoring mechanism that actually helps the rep score better during the call. So he doesn't have to, she doesn't have to score after the call, how a call went. It can actually improve as the call is going through and mm-hmm. improve the score of the conversation based on your, the outcomes that you expect in the conversation. So. The, the first thing you do is, is make sure that every one of your providers or your vendors, your partners are embracing AI themselves in a way that is more meaningful than the obvious. That's number one. And that, and that they're doing it responsibly, right? They're not exposing your data. They're not just connecting to chat GPT and sort of like throwing your data out there because, you know, that becomes part of the public domain, et cetera. So like, make sure that that is happening. Right. The next, the second, the second uh, aspect of it. So that's, that's, that's go do now. The second aspect of it is, is look, the beautiful part of the AI and the scary part of the AI is it can be whatever you want it to be. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So in that creates a lot of either, you know, for those who are early adopters and innovators, you know, leaning forward and being like, all right, what can I make it be? And for those who are a little bit more on the pragmatist side, they're like, you know, show me first before I jump into early. Mm -hmm. And when we go talk to, you know, our own customer base it's a little bit divided. Like some people be like, yeah, give me, give me all, give me now, give me fast, give me flying cars. And some others are saying, no, 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 no. I heard that AI hallucinates, AI makes shit up. Right. AI does these other things, and I don't want to be part of that you know, equation. Right. So the, the, what we all need to do as an industry is, 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 is continue to sell the vision of whatever that vision is. So as that vision is, there is no world in which it, there is a general AI assistant for reps and managers. Right now, the way it shows up is in the task, right? You're going to do a call. You're going to do a deal inspection. You're going to do a forecast, and AI is assisting all those things. Yeah. But, the, the, but the panacea or the world that we imagine is one in, in which you wake up and, and your AI tells you, Matt, today you got two deals to close. Mm -hmm. You got three deals that got pushed out and, and the customer went cold. So you need to re-engage that conversation. You're, sh you're short on pipeline for next quarter and you have a QBR at the end of the week that you need to prepare for. Would you like to big, book, book your calendar full of those, those activities? Right. And organize your day accordingly so that your day is the most productive. And then once you go into each of those tasks, there's yet another AI who's guiding you to be optimized around, you know, creating a deck or running a meeting or running your call or getting prepared for your QBR. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's sort of like, it's so that you see that there is a sort of like a nesting of AIs, one that is generalized for your day or the context of you're trying to do. And then that is very task specific and, and, yeah. and things are going into that direction. And it's very encouraging. So we all need to a move in that direction. And B, ask our vendors to start moving in that direction too, so we can get the most productivity out of the applications that we buy. So one of the one of the number of ways I've tried to get people more comfortable and more, you know, out of the fear cycle of AI is to talk about like, hey, listen, let's let's assume for a moment you're not going to lose your job. Let's assume for a moment you're going to be able to still play your mortgage. You're going to have something to do. We separate this idea of tasks and jobs, right? Like the job of marketing in 1960 is a little different than what it was 40 years later, when you know, versus where it is now. The right. tasks are different. The job, the outcome is still the same. So if you think about a task, a job, and then the body of work to get there. Like yeah. if you're in sales, your job is not to write emails. Your job is not to follow a sequence. Your job is not to like shoehorn your way into someone's calendar. Like the job and the body of work is to build a relationship, create a win-win scenario here. So talk a little bit about the context of AI. And also, I mean, this kind of speaks to the importance of sort of having a consistent approach to all those different tasks and jobs yeah. to do the body of work well. So it, it begins... So. You know, I, I think I stole this from somebody else. It's, it's mindset, tools, and skin, it's skill set. So it always begins with the mindset. And this is the problem, is that if you associate your worth, your self-worth, with the tasks that you do, mm -hmm. then you're in trouble. Yeah. Because those tasks... So if you're a great email writer, if you're a great follow-upper, you know what I mean? If you're a great, you know, preparer for meetings... Those things are going to go away. It's like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I love washing dishes, but I'm not better than the dishwasher. I'm actually more wasteful. Right. You, you see what I mean? I find washing dishes as a Zen moment, but I am, the machine is way better than me, and more efficient, and like, oh, that's all sorts of things. So the, the, we need to disassociate ourselves from the tasks that we do and associate ourselves with the goals that we're trying to achieve as a whole, right? So as a sales rep, your goal, your goal is to solve a problem, identify the problem, solve the problem in a way that is win-win, build a relationship so you can get, you know, so you can get permission to solve the next problem. Right. You, you see what I mean? And there is no AI that will ever replace that because there is so much that is very human to human communication. That right. is, you know, sort of like fifth sense level stuff that we can't code that, right. that won't be replaced. So get good at doing that, right? right. So, you know, fix your mindset into an expansive way of seeing opportunities as opposed to seeing threats. Yep. And you, you know, the, the old adage, like when you buy a car, if you buy a Subaru, all of a sudden you start seeing Subarus everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. so if you fix your mind and saying, look, AI is a threat, you're going to see threat everywhere and yeah. you're going to see nothing but threats. But if you fix it in, in your mind and saying, look, AI is an opportunity, then you start seeing opportunities everywhere. So you need to start fixing your mind. It's like, what can you do for me? And how can I identify more opportunities? Then the second mm -hmm. thing is that you fix it in your process. Yeah, yeah. Have to make it part of your process so you can you can feel good about doing it so it becomes you know you know you know chop wood carry water kind of stuff as opposed to like being all you know what is it going to do for me is it going to you know hallucinate is it going to do something weird uh and, and the third part is like you know it, it needs to be part of your you know if you're a manager you're part of a, 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 an organization it needs to be part of the organizational culture in that it's okay for you to you know um 
you know, disrupt your, your job to find a better way to do it. Like it, that needs to be culturally acceptable that I'm going to break this process to come up with a better process because a better process can do the outcome faster. So I'm going to stop there and see. No, it's really good. We're talking today on Sales Pipeline Radio with Manny Medina. He's the founder and CEO of Outreach. And um, I find it interesting that some of the same people that worry that the BDR function is going away because of AI are also the same who complain that their sales team don't, doesn't spend enough time actively selling right? That they spend all their time like doing administrative tasks and writing new emails. And you got 14 different tabs open with 14 different tools to do 14 different parts of the process. Right. right. And so like, it just seems to me like if we want the, 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 the artists, the craftsmen that are salespeople to do what they do best, if we want more active selling time, if we want the humanity and sales to be the majority of what they do, there's, there's a lean in moment there for AI, but also a lean in around sort of really improving the process and not having 14 tabs open anymore. Absolutely. And, and, and they, the, uh, I think somebody at Verizon called this a swivel chair tax. There's mm -hmm. a real tax of going for an application to application. The they user experience is different. You're trying to remember where, where things were at. And, and, and sort of the, the, the real impetus for all of us leaders is to figure out how to minimize the swivel chair tax and take tasks away from our reps right. so that they can focus on solving somebody else's problem. See, the beautiful thing about, about sales is that your job is to get into somebody else's mind and see the words that are not being spoken and right. to read between the lines is to, is to, is to get yourself, yourself into, into this hyper empathetic point of view where you're really understanding your, from your customer point of view what the problems are so you can actually craft a solution. Yes. And the more time you have to, you have to do that, the better off you're going to be. So yeah. I just don't see a world in which we continue to do this nonsense of, you know, 20 point solutions to the five jobs. Yeah. Because that, that is just not where the world is going. You, you, you see what I mean? So like the, the, the outcome that we're seeing is an AI that works on the, on the back of a single platform where you can do, you know, your, you know, your prospecting job, your deal qualifying job, your forecasting job, your run your meetings, your build your account plans, meet your actual plans. And the AI just learns from all that and sort of continues to get better in helping you at your whole job, not just each of the tasks. Yeah. Um, had literally earlier today, I had a call with a, a CMO who was just really struggling with make, getting sort of their BDR function to work and be successful. And over the course of the call, I realized a couple of things. First of all, they were focused on BDR as the function. They, that, I said, that's not the strategy. That is a tactic. That is a channel. That is a component of what is a bigger strategy, which in their case is like an outbound motion for target accounts. And I said, like it, the way that if you, if you're setting it up to automate it and, and just do it automatically, you're going to send a bunch of crap spam to a bunch of people that is not going to land well. Right. As opposed to saying like, what is the, what is our strategy for engaging and building value with this audience? We leverage machines and robots and tools and data. Right. to tell us who to call next, right? I mean, the, it, no matter how complicated this all gets, account-based motions, whatever, every sales rep I know just has the same questions. Who do I call next? And what should I talk with them about, right? right? right. And right. the last thing you want to do is go spend, I remember like, you know, back in the day, like spending 45 minutes doing research to make, to leave a 30 second voicemail. That doesn't sound very efficient. <laughs> and yet people still do that. So I think about the machines, I think about the tools, I think about the data, they can shorten that time to tell me, not only help me make a better call and better conversation, but to fast track that information to me for me to go have more time in front of my customers. Right. As, as opposed to more time in front of my CRM and that swivel chair mentality. Right. No, you know what's really interesting? Because I, I hear this a lot, right? Like, is the BDR job going to go away? Is the SDR job going to go away? And, and like, there, you know, the, the, the job, you know, when... when New technologies do display some things, and there's more, you know, the, the, the old technology ends up finding new uses. Yeah. So, for instance, we still see SDRs being productive when you're trying to crack into new markets when nobody knows you. We're a person-to-person -person conversation about what, what the hell is that you do and how it can help me in the general sense of, of, my, of my organization is valuable. So having, you know, having a conversation at that level is super helpful in, in new, in, so in like, in like new customers, or in like, you know, in a, you know I, I also see SDRs and BDRs being helpful in an in expansion place. You know, so there is a place in which you deploy it, but the, the general statements of like, oh, it's working or it's not working, yeah. lacks the context. Like what industry are you in? Like, is it oversaturated? Like, are you already a winner? And like, everybody knows you. So the SDR incremental code is not gonna help. Right. So like, it, it, it's, it, it, these general statements are just maddening, right? Because this is the, the, the problem of social media that the pithy argument sort of wins the day. And it lacks the, the, the consistency and the, and the sort of like the nuance that we as organizational leaders need to actually make a decision. Yeah.
Uh, we're running out of time here on our episode. I think the last question I have for you is, you know, is, and we're September, right? And people are already starting to think about next year, which is smart. I think tend to think of like Q4. If you're a calendar fiscal, your Q4 is is quarter zero. It's the time you should sort of get your mind right, as we talked about earlier, strategize and yeah. build, put some of those things in place. Um, what are some productive things and practical things that that sales leaders should be thinking about and prioritizing for their teams using technology now into 2024? I think that they should all be thinking about how do you look, if you're not actively thinking about making your reps more productive and minimizing that swivel chair tax, your competitor is. Yes. So you have to really, you know, we are in a world right now that, that, you know, because everyone is to some degree frozen, you have to overinvest in that customer relationship. You have to overinvest in, in sort of like the, um, how do you know the, the the winner in this in this kind of environment is the status quo? So you have to figure out what is your key, your mm-hmm. approach into that customer conversation that will unseat on status quo and get the conversation open. Not even for your product, but just the conversation going. You yeah. know that could be an overinvestment in SCs. That could be an overinvestment in you know that that could be you know more um, you know overlay reps. It could be a number of things. But mm-hmm. for you to be able to, to, to make that investment, you have to get efficiency out of somewhere else. You won't be able to just add headcount and call it good. You have to, you have to get your reps from being out of 50 to 60% participation to like 70, 80, 90% participation. And if you're not planning for it, somebody else will. So you have to get your, 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 your mind right and you yeah. have to lean in and to make productivity gains so that you can invest in your sales cycle in a way that makes sense. Well, when you say competitors, I think about that two ways. I think one, you know, your your direct competitors trying to sell to the same customers are adopting this technology, making it easier for your prospects to buy, creating a better experience with their sales team than your sales team. Your other competitors, the other startup down the street that wants to hire salespeople. Right. Right. And like Andrew here, who's like, so like, dude, that 45 minutes just to leave a voicemail like that hurts. Right. Because you've been there. If you've been a seller, you've been there. If you're doing your homework and doing it right. If some other company can offer you an opportunity to provide the right tool set to be to be just as successful or successful to do more of the job that you love. Right. That's going to be a competitive differentiator in the hiring market, let alone your competitive market and your go to market strategy. Of course. And, 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 And if you don't have high performing reps, it's just as bad as not having technology. Yeah. So it's so you have to like this is not a static game. Like the game doesn't end with technology or go to market. You have to have it all play nicely and safe. Manny, I know how busy you are. I really appreciate you taking the time today to do this. Um, everyone check out outreach.io if you don't know them before, haven't before. Um, they've got a conference coming up uh, here in Seattle. I'm super excited to get out uh, for that one and uh, just check out their content as well. Super good stuff. Manny, thanks so much. Thank you and come to Unleash. See you all later. All right. We'll see you at Unleash. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll see you next week on another episode of uh, Sales Pipeline Radio. Take care. Thank you. See you, Matt. Good to see you.